Measure for Measure. Well, as Peter has said, Measure for Measure has got the reputation of being a problem play. Um, it's sort of complex and multi-layered, uh, with you know a story around morality and responsibility and corruption at both a personal and a political level. And the problem, or at least one of the problems, um, seems to be that a great play doesn't answer questions, it asks them, and that's exactly what this play does. It leaves you with all sorts of questions and, and very few answers. You have to work them out for yourself. So there are no absolutes at all in this play. Uh, no easy answers, no black and white, no fixed and immutable laws to sort of wrap things up nice and cosily for you. It's all shades of grey, and as such, has us thinking of the relative rights and wrongs of the various dilemmas it poses long afterwards, or long after we've seen the play. We don't go home with a nice warm, cosy glow of having been well entertained and that's it, forget about it. But in a far more contemplative and sort of perplexed frame of mind as we try to kind of work out what's going on and, you know, about the challenges it poses and where we ourselves, you know, consider the line needed to be drawn. So, as such, um, I'd suggest that it's very much a play for the 21st century, as it taps into this kind of rich vein of moral ambiguity, leading us to uh, begin to evaluate and consider the structure, or hopefully uh, consider the structure of our own value systems, which hopefully we have developed or are developing as we mature in order to reach any kind of answers that really satisfy ourselves um, from what the play brings up. And it's something that I think is really very much needed for today, which is why I think it's, it would be a great play to see more of in the 21st century. It also juxtaposes um, quite a lot of different themes. I've put a few of them up there, so there are a lot of different themes for us to consider. Sort of power versus responsibility. So, you know, what are the responsibilities that go with holding power? Um, they're not often talked about. Um, does Angelo wield them wisely? He uses borrowed power. Does he use it wisely or does he use it responsibly or does he become a petty tyrant? Um, justice versus mercy. The Duke admits to having been too lenient in the way he's applied Venice's laws. Um, but, you know, where's the line between leniency and mercy? Um, and what about applying the letter of the law? How do you, again, where do you draw the line between the letter of the law and bringing in mercy? So, you know, on and on it goes through these, these different, uh, it's almost sort of dualities, as it were, ask, making us look at the sort of dual nature of things. But to a very large ex extent, you know, the play doesn't, doesn't give us answers. It leaves us to make our own minds up. And this is where it's, it's a really grown-up play in that respect. It, um, it's leaving us to go and work things out for ourselves, where we think this line needs to be drawn. So by the end of the play, we're presented with various conundrums um, and very few answers, leaving us to work out some of the sort of moral issues, the complex moral issues, uh, where there are really no, no simple or no trite solutions to them. It also looks at the principles of good government um, and the principles of faith, religious doctrine, and obviously also compassion. And it's concerned very much with the principles of good and evil and clearly shows us the ambiguities that are inherent in this dualistic approach, good and evil. So who is good or who's bad? Uh, you know, at the beginning of the play, Angelo is the good guy. Um, but by the end, we, we see a very different side of him and we start to think, well, actually, no, he's the baddie in, in this play. And it's the opposite with Claudio. We start out with Claudio as the, the, the criminal. He's imprisoned and condemned for breaking the law. But then, actually, is his crime so bad? Um, particularly when we learn that he really sincerely loves his lady and considers himself as good as married to her. So it, you know, sort of things, things get shifted about a bit on the chessboard. In addition, the author also shows us some of the major pitfalls um, that lie in the path of those who have set themselves on the spiritual journey, on the spiritual path, versus those who haven't. There's a very clear divide in the play between the likes of Mistress Oberdan and Pompey, who quite unashamedly embrace uh, drunkenness and licentiousness, um, are materialistic, and 
really are thought of and considered to be little better than animals in the way they can't control their base desires, as it were. And then you have the likes of Angelo and the Duke and Isabella, who aspire to a much higher code and consider themselves well beyond these vices and to have control of themselves. But if you stand back a little and look at it, what you see in Mistress Overdone and her cohorts are, you know, they very unashamedly are who they are. Uh, and they don't pretend otherwise. Uh, there's a purity and an authenticity in the way that they don't pretend to be anything that they're not. Uh, Lucio, on the other hand, who kind of sits in the middle way, way between Angelo, the Duke and Isabella, and uh, Mistress Overdone and her crowd, he considers himself to be better um, than Mistress Overdone and Pompey because he's more affluent but he indulges in all of the vices that, that, that they do, and his behavior is no different from theirs. And the Duke, Isabella, and Angelo, whilst considering themselves of a much higher moral order and aiming you know, for the higher realms, as it were, all fall prey to pretension, lack of compassion, abdication of responsibility, lack of self-awareness, um, even hypocrisy and, you know, much else that really falls short of um, the high self-image that they have of themselves. And this is what I call the spiritual bypass, and it's the dilemma for anyone who aspires to the spiritual path. And um, it's generally a very busy place. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us spend at least some time, if not a lot of time, on it, because it ultimately speaks to the, uh, to the world of illusion, uh, what the Buddhists call the, the, the Maya, and we all inhabit this to a greater or lesser extent. Mm. Um, you know, as the human psyche sort of strains towards its full potential, it meets all sorts of pitfalls and problems and challenges along the way. And it, it, the path is to absorb these, to overcome them, uh, to resolve them. Uh, and one of the biggest is to actually see clearly, see with clarity. So all of us have a vision or a story that we hold in our consciousness about who we are and uh, that we present, not just to others, but I think more importantly to ourselves. Um, the story we tell is, is initially for, for our own benefit, you know. It's our self-image, which is it's a, as much about who we aspire to be, who we want to be, and we try to present that to the crowd, as it were, um, as it is really about who we really are. In fact, we often are, are very ashamed and are trying to cover up the bits of ourselves that we don't want others to see. So we all wear a set of blinkers at some level or other. It's just, in some cases, they're very big blinkers, and in others, you know, they're much, much smaller. So all of us often fail to see the many, many ways in which we fall short of how we like to think of ourselves and portray ourselves, both to ourselves and to others. We all have pretensions at some level, and it's just a matter of how conscious we are of them as to how we can work with them or not. We all run a version of ourselves that contains large elements of illusion, who we want to be or how we would like to be thought of. And one of the first steps on the road, on the spiritual path, really is to find our way, to see our way through this web of illusion that we've woven. And not just with regard to how the outside world works, because actually, you know, the nice comfortable illusion of a patriarchal government looking after you and, you know, sort of run everything running uh, for, for your benefit is, is a complete fantasy. It's a very comfortable fantasy that you have to grow up from. But you're we're taught this and conditioned into thinking that way from a very young age. So again, part of growing up is to see our way through that in the outside world. Um, but we also have to see it with regard to ourselves, where we've told ourselves a story or maybe been conditioned in a view of ourselves by outside comments, you know, teachers telling you you're stupid maybe, or um, I, one that I can confess to from growing up is I, I grew up thinking girls weren't as good as boys because, because I was, you know, my, my mother came from a, a background where boys were better than girls basically. And it gets conditioned into you, and you have to, as you grow up, learn to see through this. 
Um, but it's disturbing. <laughs> it's difficult. Um, and it is some of the hardest work we will ever do on ourselves is to really clearly see our own flaws and our inconsistencies and our blind spots and learn to like who we really are and respect who we really are, warts and all. It's the biggest challenge I think most of us um, have. But beginning to see this clearly, <coughs> I think, is one of the major milestones on the journey uh, to bringing ourselves in alignment. And we see this starting to happen uh, in Measure for Measure with the characters in Measure for Measure. It's, it's a really difficult one. It, it tests our self-image and our desire to be on this road to the limit. It can be brutal and it can be devastating. I can hold my hand up to that on a few occasions when I've realised how far short of what I've aimed for I've really been. And it, the, world, the bottom falls out of your world for a while. You think, oh, you know, and you realise that you've been such a hypocrite and presented yourself unknowingly uh, to people who've probably seen you more clearly than you've seen yourself. And, and you, you then, you have to, you know, any true spiritual seeker has got to pick themselves up and dust themselves down well and truly and then quietly and determinedly just get on with the task of finding ways of bringing the illusion of what you want to be and the reality of who you are closer together into this middle path really that Peter <laughs> talks about. So you've got to sort of weave together um, the two to make, make it a new reality. So it can be quite terrifying, it can be very dispiriting um, to actually see how much work we really have to do on ourselves um, and to meet the aspirations that we have. And it's not work for the faint-hearted. Um, Mistress Overdone and her crew don't even want to begin to go there. So you have to applaud those who do, even if they fall short, um, as I say, spend time on the spiritual bypass. Um, it requires a very rare degree of rigour and, and self-honesty that is difficult to achieve, which is why so many of us, as I say, spend time on the spiritual bypass. And it's not a quick process. In my experience, it is something that is ongoing. Um, and the moment you start to relax your guard is, is the most dangerous moment, um, because once you consider the job done or you've achieved that bit or whatever, the universe has a way of coming out and biting you on the bum. Mm -hmm and you realise that you've tripped up and <laughs> there's still more to do. So in Measure for Measure, it's clear that the main characters, um, they all grow and they all learn uh, something of themselves by the end of the, of the play. So we're seeing this process playing out in front of us. It, they're not overtly bad or evil, but they lack insight and they lack self-knowledge. And by the end, they're coming to see themselves a little clearer and to know themselves a little better. So let's look at them in turn. We start with Angelo, who's immediately presented to us by the Duke as an upright character. Uh, he's a model of probity and virtue. He's morally stern and incorruptible. And he undoubtedly thinks of himself as an honourable gentleman. This is where he has his blinkers on. Because it's clear that he's been anything but in his dealings with Mariana, um, his uh, supposed fiancé. He's reputed to be a man whose blood is a very snow broth, one who never feels the wanton stings and motions of the sense, but doth rebate and blunt his natural edge with profits of the mind. And again, Lord Angelo is precise, stands at a guard with envy, scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more bread than stone. So he's rather austere, got a very repressed nature you you can see that very clearly from this a classic case of mind over heart he's not a heart-centered individual a man who's actually very shut down to his own nature and here's our, our first hint of this, this critical imbalance uh, within Angelo to be a man he has to first admit that passionate red blood flows through his veins you know like the rest of us uh, rather than ice so this is something that he's going to find out about all too soon. You know, he comes, he comes across with, as I say, the universe bites you on the bum. Mm. So it's clear his metal has never been truly tested. And whilst adhering very strictly to the human laws, he fails to regard the higher laws uh, and falls at this first hurdle. And the Duke 
sets out to really test him at that level. Peter's talked about that. The Duke takes the initiatory role of the tester with uh, Angelo to see if he is as worthy as he would seem. Hence, we shall see if power changes purpose, what our seamers be, the Duke tells us. So to wield power wisely, not just, you know, requires not just probity uh, and adherence to law, but also compassion and mercy, something that he clearly at this moment lacks. Uh, the good ruler, um, a true prince, is required to exercise Solomon-like judgment. Uh, and the Duke tells him, your scope is as mine own, so to enforce or qualify the laws as to your soul seems good. But believing his own press about how wonderful he is, Angelo lacks humility. And as it says in the Gospels of both St. Luke and St. Matthew, and Peter's alluded to, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. For with what measure ye meet, with that same shall man meet to you again. In other words, be careful how you treat people on the way up because you're going to meet them on the way down. And Angelo meets his Waterloo in Isabella. Someone who seemingly vies with Angelo in the party stakes for the laurels. He sees her and, against all reason, his ice-cold blood heats up. Isabella, as she appeals to his better nature, asks Angelo to go to your bosom, knock there and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. Unfortunately for her, it awakens in him the appetitive or passionate part of his soul which has been slumbering up until this moment. Lust for her rears its ugly head. And in fairness to Angelo, he really is quite appalled by this. What dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? He asks himself. And in a rigorous cross-examination of himself, uh, after Isabella's departure, he vacillates between self-righteousness and self-disgust, yet this doesn't stop him from effectively going on to blackmail her, into having sex with him. He shows himself quite squeamish at putting this indecent proposal to her, and for, for a time they talk at cross-purposes. And for a man who's denied his own red-blooded human nature... He urges Isabella to give in to her human instincts and to stop pretending to be a nun and be herself. Pretending to be a nun and be herself. Be that you are. That is a woman. If you be more, your nun. If you be one, as you are well expressed by all external warrants, show it now by putting on the destined livery. So he's urging her to be what he considers a woman to be, i.e. fallen. He assumes that she's been pretending in some way or other that, she, that, that, you know, in the same way that he's been pretending to find sex distasteful, that she's pretending the same thing. And quite ironically, he's urging her to be authentic and giving <laughs> to her inner urges, as it were. But having set foot on this road to perdition, he doesn't pull back. He, he's aware of what he's doing, but he doesn't pull back. And he actually makes things worse by pulling rank on his. He just piles sin on sin. He pulls rank on Isabella, um, using his status to shield himself from any accusations she might, might make. And worse, you know, we can see how powerfully a man's passionate nature can actually overtake him when it's released from artificial constraint, because he's had it very much um, subdued up until this point, and it just breaks the bounds. Uh, as he threatens, you know, if she won't do as he wants her to do, he'll not just execute Claudio but he'll torture him beforehand as well. So he's really piling the pressure on her. And he gets his way, he thinks, and he beds seemingly Isabella. But despite this, he continues to behave dishonourably and sends orders for Claudio's execution. He had no intention of honouring his bargain, and he actually justifies this to himself as well. He has what he considers, or he makes up to be good reasons. He, he, he kids himself. Um, and it's seemingly just therefore that really the tables are turned on to uh, uh, turned on him with the bed trick and he in fact beds his his former betrothed who is as good as or considered in law as good as a wife to him um, and he jilted and slandered her he didn't just jilt her he slandered her also as his excuse for jilting her he, he accused her of being unfaithful um, just because her dowry was lost at sea 
And so we see, you know, yet another example of his dishonesty and his materialism as well that he's been covering up. And despite signs of remorse in his speech as he waits for the Duke's return to, to Vienna, when he's actually unmasked and he's accused by uh, Isabella, his first instinct is to try to bluff his way out of it, um, to bluff his way out of the predicament. And he blames the friar and he blames that pernicious woman, as he calls her. And it's only when he finds out that the Duke is fully aware at every level of his perfidy that he actually finally gives in and comes to see himself fully and see himself clearly. Then, good prince, no longer hold session, no longer session hold upon my shame, but let my trial be mine own confession. Immediate sentence then and sequent death is all the grace I beg, he says. And it's ironic that it is the pleas for mercy from the two women that he has very, very badly wronged that actually save him. Okay, so now let's look at Isabella. The other competitor for the most pious person in Venice. Uh, when we meet her, she's about to enter um, a convent as a novice of the Order of St. Clair, and that's quite significant in itself because it was an order renowned for its seclusion, its penitence, and its extreme poverty and austerity. And her excess of piety is seen very clearly when she asks, and have you nuns, no further privileges? And then hurries on to say, I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint. So she's wanting to be more Catholic than the Pope himself, really. And failing to see actually how presumptuous that actually is and how the sin of pride, you know, spiritual pride is actually just hovering close at her shoulder. And it gets worse as we discover that her piety is potentially not really the main reason for her entering the convent, but rather fear. She finds the world a frightening and out of control place and very, very challenging to be in. And she's basically seeking escape from it. And, and the convent offers safety. During the play, she is called upon to find her courage, both moral and otherwise, and to act compassion and forgiveness in reality, not just consider it as a, as a concept. She is asked effectively to spiritually grow up. She's appalled at Angelo's proposal, having been taught that fornication is a deadly sin that would damn her soul for eternity. So her rejection of Angelo's proposal is inevitable, given that that's her viewpoint. But what's surprising is how quickly and easily she accepts that her brother's death is a consequence of her, her rejecting that. You know, she goes so quickly into, well, he's going to have to die then, sort of thing. <laughs> um, and in a very self-righteous manner, she sort of races off to give her brother the good news. Then Isabel live chaste and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. Um, and when all, uh, Claudio argues with her that having sex with Angelo in order to save her own brother's life, nature herself would count as a virtue, not a sin. Um, she rounds on him. I mean, she really rounds on him and unleashes a whole torrent of abuse at him. Oh, you beast, you faithless coward, oh, dishonest wretch. Wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? And she rants on. Indeed, her reaction is really over the top, and it again hints at this fear of the adult human world and explains her desire to run away from it. Thy sin's not accidental, she rages at him, but a trade which is an uncalled for remark, really, comparing his love for Juliet, uh, who he considers all but his wife, to effectively a whore's trade. And in her extreme piety, uh, and one might argue fear of the sexual act, she forgets Jesus' compassion and absolution for the woman who was taken in adultery. Um, and... You know, he basically says, if any man here is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And of course, they all slink off. Uh, and and he, he forgives this woman and she forgets all of this. Her supposed virtue really starts to become looking more like a bit of a vice as she really fails to show any compassion or grace. And it's interesting that the Renaissance view of women was that they ultimately needed to combine three things. Um, within themselves as the, the three graces, beauty, chastity, and passion. And Isabella 
is unable to do this. She achieves two out of three, beauty, which is obviously given to her at some physical level, chastity, which she adheres to, but she is fearful of passion. And it's at this point that the Duke steps in. Um, and, you know, in his role as the tester and the initiator, much as he, as he has done with Angelo. And he opens up the chance for Isabella to grow and learn compassion and to learn more about herself in what he proposes. And it's interesting to note that when he suggests Mariana takes Isabella's place um, with Angelo, she doesn't so, show the same repugnance or fear for Mariana's mortal soul as she sort of rants on for herself, happy to accept the rather flimsy excuse that the jilted betrothal was as good as a marriage anyway. And at the end of the play, we see as a, uh, Isabella is, she's really beginning to step up to the mark. She's, uh, you know, sort of growing into herself, really. She is basically a very good person who, as I say, has been on the spiritual bypass a bit. She's asked to publicly accuse Angelo, which is a really big thing, you know, to stand up and admit to this in public. And she finds the courage and she does this, even though the Duke, dressed as a friar, warns her that he actually might oppose her. So, uh, you know, she's told it won't be all plain sailing. So she stands up before all and she tells her story of her supposed shame. And this requires that she really digs deep within herself in order to bring justice through. Uh, that she does so really speaks to her ability to conquer her fears. And Angelo's fate rests ultimately in, in her hands. Mariana pleads with Isabella um, to help Angelo on the basis that redemption and rehabilitation are possible for all men. And it depends upon um, the director and the version of the play you've seen as to how long it takes before Isabella steps up to the mark. <laughs> basically so it's one of those points of dramatic tension but finally she reacts uh, and in true christian fashion she finds her compassion and kneeling before the duke she begs for claudio's uh, for angelo's life even though she believes at this point that angelo has killed her brother so it really is a huge act of forgiveness on her <coughs> part and finally we see someone who's not just acting a Christian part, but who's truly, truly beginning to inhabit it. And then the Duke, Duke Vincenzo, he's loved and esteemed, and he's clearly got many good and noble qualities, yet there is, it, it does speak to the fact that he is at some level quite weak and a ruler with poor boundaries because Venice has, has become quite a cesspit. Um, lacking morals uh, in sort of moral anarchy almost as it were he's been in office many many years but despite uh, despite all you know his good and essentially admirable nature he's he's been very lax he's let let things slip let his responsibilities uh, slip at striking the right balance between applying the law and applying mercy and as a result you know Venice has, Venice has become a den of iniquity uh, and it needs sorting out. And he recognises this. Give him his due. He recognises this. and he al But he also recognises that he doesn't want to be the one to sort it out. Partly because um, he considers he's viewed in a certain way. And to change that would change the people's love for him. And he doesn't. He wants to be liked. Like all of us, he wants to be liked. So he looks at Angelo and he sees the requisite qualities in Angelo, um, and he basically abdicates responsibility for sorting this mess out to Angelo, thinking, you know, he, he can do it and then the Duke can come back in. Um, and he justifies this abdication with a rather weak excuse of conducting an experiment into the nature of man. So he himself, um, although he's got many sterling qualities and is clearly ahead of Angelo and Isabella on their spiritual path, also has a slight case of the blinkers in certain areas. And he sets out to test Angelo, um, and his testing enables Angelo to know himself better and to see himself and his flaws more clearly. So in this role, as Peter said, he's the archetypal tester of the mysteries, setting up a situation you know, that challenges the moral and spiritual fibre of an individual and gets them you know, to very clearly make choices. And in his disguise, he's 
very happily like a puppet master, a true Machiavellian prince. I mean, Bacon stroke Shakespeare, obviously read Machiavelli's treatise on this. And he's pulling the strings of the plot. Um, but we also see that as the plot develops, that the Duke, who um, Aeschylus has characterised as one that, as Peter said, above all strives contented, especially to know himself. So he's a man who, who um, wants to further self-knowledge. As the plot develops, we also see that he himself is gaining experience and gaining more knowledge about himself. He's a fellow seeker further along the road um, than Angelo and Isabella, who, who you could call uh, really his protégés. Although it's evident at the end that his lax rule is potentially going to continue, um, it's left a little open, I think, as to whether he's learnt something from that. We also see at the beginning of the play, he protests to Friar Thomas that his disguise, when he, he uh, asks to go into disguise, is not in order to pursue amorous adventures, as the friar potentially thinks, telling him, believe not that the dribbling dart of love can pierce a complete bosom. He thinks himself immune to uh, Cupid's darts, yet by the end he's offering Isabella his hand in mass marriage. Uh, is this because he's fallen in love with her? Um, we don't know. The author doesn't make that clear at any level. Um, or is it just that he considers that here is somebody who's worthy of his hand? Who knows? Indeed, um, we don't even know if Isabella does accept his hand. In Indeed, there is a suggestion, and again, it depends upon the director and how you choose to read it and with what charity you read it, um, that Isabella is the object of some moral stroke emotional blackmail on the part of the Duke. Because having been unmasked um, as being the friar, he reminds her, your friar is now your prince. And she also later learns, she's kept in ignorance of the fact that he saved her brother's life. He keeps that back. Um, to kind of spring on her later um, so that she learns that he saved her brother's life and she obviously has to be grateful for that so does he have an ulterior mo motive in behaving that way and his repeated proposition to Isabella give me your hand and say you will be mine and then a little bit later where to if you're a willing ear if you're a willing ear incline what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine fails to elicit any kind of response from Isabella both times. She doesn't, she doesn't respond. And as the play ends, we're left wondering whether she has grown sufficiently to bring her gifts into the world or whether she still wants to escape. Because she would obviously make a very fitting mate for the Duke uh, in ruling Venice. So what's true is that all three of the main protagonists actually have learnt, some more painfully than others, um, about what it is to be fallible and to be human. Now, one of the other major themes running through the play is that of sex and sexuality, or rather the Catholic version of it, and all the attendant potential for hellfire and damnation that, uh, that it brings with it. So what's quite striking about the play is how both Angelo and Isabella themselves consider sexual attraction and, sexual, um, and sexuality to be unwholesome, and foul and perverse. And it's a sign of how very far they have tried to remove themselves from their human nature, showing their level of moderation or understanding for this basic expression of what is the essential life force within us. But when such pronounce, uh, pronouncements are made as, and get this folks, the Catholic Church holds that it were better for sun and moon to drop from heaven for the earth to fail and for all the many millions who are upon it to die of starvation in extremist agony as far as temporal affliction goes than that one soul I will not say should be lost but should even commit one venial sin as a Catholic of it in Victorian times a cardinal in Victorian times said that when that is what's being preached at you it's easier to understand Isabella's attitude to what's being asked of her. She's been very, very well indoctrinated uh, within, within society, uh, where, you know, within 
even up until very recently, a, a, a woman's choices were very black and white. You know, she was going to be chaste. She was going to be a virgin and then a mother, uh, or she was a whore. And that was it. There was not a lot of wriggle room in between those two. Um, and as Angelo has to learn more about his true nature as a man, that red blood flows through his veins, which he's been repressing, Isabella has yet to find any kind of accommodation or possibly even an understanding for what it truly means to be a woman. And indeed, society gave her very little leeway to do that. The Catholic Church eradicated almost all aspects of the teachings of the Divine Feminine that flowed out of the various mystery traditions and the wisdom teachings. So it eradicated these from its own doctrine. Women were at best flawed. They were given to sin and they were responsible for the fall of man. So you had those burdens on your shoulder before you drew your first breath. And indeed, you know, the echoes of this belief still, still rebound today. Um, you still trip across it today. So the balanced union of the divine feminine and the divine masculine was an important aspect in all of the ancient wisdom streams. The source, the one, the all, however you want to see it, split itself into two different streams, the masculine and the feminine, in order to know itself better. Indeed, Time and time again, we sort of see in all the various myths and the wisdom teachings and the stories that, that we have, it is the goddess who births the god. And that man can only come to ultimately know God truly through union with the feminine. Neither is better. Both need each other in order to find their way back to source. And in much of the modern world, there's been an absolutely relentless focus on the divine masculine and the way that masculine power uh, expresses and describes itself in the world, guiding us to look beyond ourselves, outside ourselves for God, not within. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah.